this um, extraordinary number of registrations today. I've just been told we have more than 900. And uh, obviously the majority of you are from within Australia, but some from overseas. But against that, I also would like to extend this acknowledgement to the traditional owners on whose land you are signing in from today, right around this great continent. Well, it's wonderful to be back with you all for this second town hall event between Monash University and Mindaroo Foundation to continue this very important discussion on early childhood development and the need to reform the sector in Australia. It's something that we simply don't talk about as a nation enough. And Monash is um, particularly pleased, uh, humbled to be partnering with the Mindaroo Foundation on this, on this initiative. The partnership really does show uh, an alignment of our key values, how Monash is positioned to provide innovative research. It's evidence-based. This is not fake news. This is deeply connected to practice in order to do one thing, to enhance, enhance the outcomes of children at that precious stage of early life under the five years of age. And uh, I think it's uh, very timely at this point for me to take the opportunity to congratulate the CEO of Mindaroo Foundation's Thrive by Five initiative, the Honourable Jay Weatherall for his recent Order of Australia. Uh, and he received this for distinguished service to the people and parliament of South Australia, particularly as premier for many years and to early childhood and tertiary education. And I'd also like to congratulate both Jay as well as Nicola Forrest, co-chair and co-founder of Mindaroo Foundation. And uh, Nicola uh, joined us for our first town hall a few weeks ago. But both Jay and Nicola have uh, presented recently to the National Press Club and um, have really generated very positive momentum for their Mindaroo campaign for reform in this early childhood sector. So the Monash Mindaroo Partnership brings together powerful group policy, always important, and early childhood development experts from a range of disciplines, and we'll hear from them today. And so we're very fortunate to have, I think, a terrific panel. Uh, in addition to Jay uh, representing Mindaroo, we have from Monash University, um, Professor Katrina Williams, Marilyn Fleer, and Michael Mintram. Uh, today's session will be facilitated by Professor Rod Glover and Dr. Robin Milden. And finally, because uh, most importantly, you will all, well, 900, I'm not sure that you'll all have the opportunity to ask a question, but as well as we can cater, there will be a Q&A and uh, Professors Kim Cornish and Viv Ellis will join us uh, to, um, to, to, to deal with questions. So look, once again, the most important thing I can do now is to hand you over into um, the, the company of these uh, terrific panelists, experts, et cetera. And um, I will particularly hand you over now to uh, Professor Glover, who will take us away. Thank you. Thanks very much, Chancellor. And thank you for your ongoing support to this partnership between Monash and the Mindaroo Foundation. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Rod Glover and with Robin Milden, I'll be uh, helping to facilitate today's conversation. Uh, I'm coming to you from my hometown of Frankston on the lands of the Bunurong people. Uh, I'm a professor of policy and impact at the Monash Sustainable Development Institute. This is the second of our three town hall meetings with the Mindaroo Foundation's Thrive by Five initiative. And we're delighted to be partnering with Nicola Forrest and the Honourable Jay Weatherall uh, on this initiative and congratulate them again for their leadership. Uh, today's town hall is just one part of a larger campaign by the Mindaroo Foundation uh, that's calling for a big vision that puts early childhood policy right at the centre of the national uh, policy debate. As I mentioned, this is a second of three town halls. Uh, we're hoping that, that we'll be able, in a position to host the third town hall uh, face to face as well as Zoom to reach a wider audience. At our first town hall late last year, you'll recall that we heard from Dr Nicola Forrest uh, and our own experts, Professors Marilyn Fleer and Kim Cornish, who inspired us and lifted our sights to think about the potential for our leading research to better connect with practice. Since then, we all tuned in for the National Press Club presentation from uh, Nicola and Jay Weatherall, who will also be joining us with his reflections this afternoon. Today, we really want to ground the conversation in what is being experienced on the ground in the world of practice. 
So our starting point is how the system is being experienced and what that might tell us about what the system needs. And there is no one better to join us in that than uh, Dr. Robin Milton. I've had the privilege of working with Robin through our mutual involvement over a number of years with Save the Children, where Robin heads up the Centre for Evidence and Implementation. She's also an adjunct with us here at Monash and is an expert in the use of evaluation and evidence in practice and policy and has a long-standing career interest in early childhood years. Uh, just before I hand over to Robin for a few words, uh, I will acknowledge that we've tried to shift the balance of today's conversation. We always seek gender balance in these conversations but it's appropriate that today of all days, you're hearing more from uh, women than you are from men. So we hope that's reflected in the conversation. For the sake of brevity, I won't go into detailed biographies as impressive they are, but let me just uh, acknowledge that we'll hear from Professor Katrina Williams, our head of pa paediatrics in the Faculty of Medicine, Nursing and Health Sciences. Professor Marilyn Fleer, the Foundation Chair in Early Childhood Education Development here at Monash and Professor Michael Mintram, Director of the Governance and Policy Program at Monash. We'll then get some reflections from the Honourable Jay Weatherall, uh, the CEO of the Thrive by Five initiatives within, initiative and the driver of this initiative within the Mindaroo Foundation, and Professor Kim Cornish, the Director of the Turner Institute of Brain and Mental Health. Just a few housekeeping notes. Uh, we are recording this session to be uploaded online at a later point, so please be respectful and don't say anything that you wouldn't say in a normal public forum. Uh, today's event, as I mentioned, is in partnership with Thrive by Five and their campaign calling for universally accessible and high quality early learning and care. You can find out more about that campaign at thrivebyfive.org.au. There is a chat function. Uh, we would encourage you to use it to ask questions or make a comment. Feel free to jump in at the outset to introduce yourself, uh, give your full names and maybe the organisation that you're representing. If you have any technical issues along the way, please message tech, tech support in the chat and we'll be able to help you out. Uh, we do want to get through, spend as much time as we can engaging you in the conversation. Uh, so we hope we get to as many questions as possible. So if you get the chance to ask a question, please try and keep them succinct. Uh, with that introduction, I'll hand over to my friend and colleague, Dr. Robin Milden. Thank you very much, Rob. Thanks. Um, welcome everybody. And thank you very much to Monash for inviting me to um, help facilitate this extremely important event. I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners that I'm joining you from, elders past and present, and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders that are joining us today on our, in our meeting. I also want to acknowledge um, all over Australia today, there's been a very important rally, peaceful protest, if you like, Women's March for Justice. And it's, almost the best day to host a forum thinking about early childhood and what it can do to improve equity, ensure social justice and inclusion. And I just want to acknowledge all the women on this and the supporters of this very important women led movement. And um, hopefully we can pick up how early childhood can help support that today. So I have the great pleasure first of inviting Professor Katrina Williams to speak uh, to us. Uh, I think she's ready. Welcome, Katrina. Thanks very much, Robin. And thanks for the opportunity to talk today. I'm gonna to talk about my reflections as uh, an experience as working as a neurodevelopmental pediatrician. Um, I'm also a researcher and uh, keen to maintain the link between evidence and practice. But really today, I'm gonna to talk about the experiences that I have in my role. I receive referrals about children who have difficulties with their development or behavior generally, and uh, they might be slow to talk or have difficulties concentrating or making friends. The referral usually asks the question, does this child have a diagnosis? When I see uh, a child that's been referred to me, and I'm very uh, privileged to do that with my allied, allied health colleagues, um, we assess the child's ability that we're seeing and where we identify their strengths and difficulties. But we also um, speak with the parents or their caregivers and identify strengths and difficulties that they're having and ask about the number and types of um, community supports that they have. We do this because we know that a child's learning and behaviours emerge from their abilities, but also from their opportunities that they receive in their family and community setting. So for example, um, before the pandemic uh, commenced, I met a four-year-old 
a boy. I've changed uh, key details to ensure his anonymity. He presented with less words and phrases than would be expected for his age. And he had some hard to manage behaviors. He was refusing some food. He wanted to stick to a routine and he was sleeping really poorly. When I talked to his mum, she told me that she'd moved from London to Melbourne to marry. She'd left behind a family and a job that she loved and that she wasn't able to work here. She also told me she was caring for the boy that we were seeing with her on the day and a younger child and also her husband's parents. And on very direct questioning, she said she was feeling sad most of the time. We heard that the father was working night shift and needed to sleep most of the day. And to keep um, the boy with the difficult to manage behaviours quiet, he was watching TV for six hours every day. They weren't accessing any playgroups and they hadn't been to childcare or been using childcare at the time we saw them. So I worry that uh, many of the presenting um, difficulties that this child and family were having were preventable. Whether or not the child had a diagnosis, uh, myself and the team were thinking that community supports were urgently needed for the family, for the mum, for the grandparents, and also for the re referred child. More broadly, I worry that a system that keeps asking questions about a child's diagnosis is waiting for difficulties to arise or to become more severe before taking action is forgetting that a child's environment is important, is as important as their abilities in shaping their future. And that the things that I see every time I do a clinic, um, are pre some of them are preventable. So what could we do to prevent some of these difficulties? Um, I think prevention is achievable, but change is needed. We need to change the way we think and talk about children, think about them as having strengths and difficulties and being um, part of families that also have strengths and difficulties and think about all the opportunities that we can provide for them in the community in which we want them to thrive. I think um, across the early childhood sector, um, many of us have trained in different ways. We come from different disciplines and we work in different settings, but we all need to band together and work together and create a system that has no wrong doors for families um, and achieves a seamless child and family focused approach to their care. To do this, we need to start speaking a common language um, and uh, overcome any separations that have been created by historical funding and service structures that certainly aren't fit for purpose now and probably never were. Um, and yes, we need the system to change, um, but we can do a lot before that happens. I really think uh, if we work together with no wrong doors, we'll give every ch child the chance to thrive by five, shine by nine, and beam through their tweens and teens. Thanks. That was fantastic, that last bit, Katrina. Um, I feel like we should hashtag or tweet that. I don't know if we've got any social media going, but that should go right out right now. I, I promise I will, I will retweet and do whatever the terrific Katrina, just because of time. And if you've got some questions for Katrina, maybe keep them written down or post them in the chat, please. We've got some technicians who will be picking that up and feeding that to Rod and I. So if you've got something specific for her, please call that out. Can I move to Professor Marilyn Fleer, the Foundation Chair in Early Childhood Education Development at Monash University. Marilyn, I think you have some slides. I do. And let me just- Terrific. Share the screen. Okay. Right. Can everyone see that? So I want to begin my presentation, um, first of all, acknowledging the Bunurong people on whose land I'm actually um, zooming in on tonight. It's my, my roster day home as opposed to my roster day in the office with our COVID safe plan. And I want to begin with this idea of imagining a world with free universal childcare. And in imagining this world of Anamika, what would it be like for her growing up in a community where childcare was free and easily available to her. In this community, I would be imagining that Anamika would have a society that values, values and knows about the research evidence about why it's so important to invest in early childhood so that there is community support. 
not just having a, a value base to support this, but actually understanding that investing in very young children makes a difference to their life chances, particularly children growing up in poverty or in difficult circumstances. But also a society which values and knows that it will not only give good opportunities for, for the hardest to reach children and their families, but it's actually the foundations for a solid, wonderful society for all children. In this society, Anamika would probably have a lot of politicians who are actually prepared to listen to this evidence as well and to put in place policies and budgets as they work for and plan for an evidence-informed policy agenda, which we know universal childcare, there is an abundance of evidence to already support. What a wonderful idea it would be for Anamika growing up in this society. But this society would also need, in this imagining, uh, a whole system of institutions that support this, because institutions are the workhouses, if you like, of making these things happen. And we know we've heard about joined up services for over 20 plus years. Uh, certainly in my experience in working in government, this was on the agenda 20 years ago. Uh, moving from silos to joining up at the policy level, but also at the practice level. So Anna Maker would be growing up in a community where she could actually cycle to her childcare centre because there were paths that people had thought, been very thoughtful about how she could get there and that these pathways were maintained that she would have housing, that she wasn't moving regularly. She actually had consistent housing that she was, uh, and she had access to resources where she was warm and she wasn't going to childcare hungry. She had a nutritional diet and she had quality early educators that provided her with rich experiences. Because Anna Mika's child care educators were qualified and appropriately paid, there was this constant um, sense of being in the same, same community of people. So there wasn't staff changeover. The educators had access to resources for ongoing professional development so they could maintain the high quality programs that they so valued. And they created welcoming spaces that were inclusive to all children and in all sorts of ways and had a very much a place-based approach where whilst there might have been universal free childcare, the programs that they were creating were tailored to that particular community and spoke to those families and children in a really productive way that supported them. So these institutions not only wrap around Anamika and her family, but they provide the stability that Anamika needs growing up in Australia. Then if we look at then Anamika's um, future life trajectory, we know that through experiencing a high quality program with educators who have qualifications, we know already that Anamika will have increased her life chances of, of of, of being in a profession that she might want to be in the community and work that she might want to be in the future, to own her own home, to have access to all of the things she needs to make a difference and to have agency. And these kinds of life changes are more than quality improvement programs that we put in place. They're more than ongoing critical reflection and they're more than evidence-informed practice. These programs, these early childhood programs that children experience and the wraparound of all the other services happen because we can imagine a world for Anamika in which there is this free universal childcare, but we know it takes the Australian village to make this happen because we need this as our new normal. We, because it provides the resources for that kind of stability for Anamika and all of the services that surround her and particularly the early childhood services. And we know that this will kickstart the economy in a much better way than anyone could imagine. 
And we know in the particular context that we're talking in this week and last week with International Women's Day last week, we know this will contribute to Anamika's pay parity in the future. And, and the educators who work with her will also have pay parity and, a, and career opportunities and they'll want to continue to stay in their profession. And so this is the best thing, than, this is better than a JobKeeper program, but it takes the Australian village to make it happen. And that's why we're here today to see how we can take this forward. And I commend Mindaroo in and how they're working and this wonderful relationship we have because it's not just keeping Anamika with the bright future, but it's also continuing to support the services that surround Anamika to resource them appropriately, appropriately and imagining a world with free universal childcare is one way. Thank you. Terrific, thank you very much. Rod, I think you're taking the next intro. Yeah, so I'd like to introduce now Professor Michael Mintram, who heads up our governance and policy uh, stream of work at Monash University. And Michael, perhaps you could reflect on a couple of the comments that were made, uh, Katrina's reference to no wrong doors, and then Marilyn sort of called for an integrated approach. Thanks, Rod. And uh, might I say just how privileged I feel to be on this panel today. Uh, to be following after Professors Williams and Fleur uh, and their insights. You know, it's really um, very fascinating to consider how to be really effective early childhood education needs to be very respectful of, of the different needs that uh, individual children and families and communities present. But so often policy and policy settings kind of they don't take necessarily a one-size-fits-all approach, but there is some kind of universalizing thing that happens with policy. And uh, I think that when, when we're considering the Thrive by Five agenda, what becomes really important is to not just say, how, how, do, we, how do we design uh, better policy in this area, but actually, how do we have better approaches to policy design that will work effectively? Uh, for every child and every family uh, in, in Australia. And, and I think that what that leads us to consider as some starting points is that uh, services need to be designed with the, with the individual clients in mind. You know, what's, what's really needed here? And that's why thinking about how, how, how different children have, have, have needs that, that maybe they need to see a, see a pediatrician or they have other really difficult situations happening in the household where if they are able to connect to a center, so a center or a service is, a, is, is, is welcoming uh, to, to, a, to a family, then there's more likelihood that they can actually meet those services that can really help them. And I think so often at the moment, there are, there are cases where families fall through the cracks. Uh, and Marilyn was talking about you know, the, the, the hard to reach families. Uh, and this, this is just a really a major policy conundrum, but I think that we could do a lot better there. And I think actually with respect to that, a really important thing to, to think about in policy design here is the role of the teachers and, and really uh, seeing them not simply as you know, important service providers to families, but actually as part of a really critical uh, community uh, that can provide a conduit back to policy making so that we're learning all the time from the insights of teachers in their diverse settings and actually saying what works where and how can we emulate that? You know, where are the bright spots in the system that we can learn from? And I think in that way, really building it up. So I guess, Rod, it's a long way of saying that I think that not only do we need to think really hard about really good policy development in this area, but in the process, I think we need to approach policy development in ways that haven't necessarily been done before. And that's really putting the client and the, 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 the different differential needs of communities right at the center and saying, how can we make early childhood education in this country work in a way that brings all those possibilities of the right professional supports in the right places together? Thanks very much, Michael. And I think that sort of, that gets to the heart of the ambition of the Thrive by Five uh, initiative. And, uh, if I can, at this time, invite Jay Weatherall to share some reflections on where the agenda is up to uh, and also on today's conversation. 
Oh, thank you very much, Rod, and uh, thank you so much uh, for this opportunity to speak to, to, to such a large and important audience. And I, I'd like to also uh, acknowledge that I come to you today from the land of the Wajak Noongar people here in Perth, uh, and also uh, acknowledge this important national movement that's occurring today uh, when uh, women are raising their voices about uh, issues of discrimination and abuse that they've been suffering uh, for, uh, well, for as long as we can remember and uh, the need to do something assertive about it. So it's, uh, I think it's a very powerful time. And I think that uh, female economic empowerment, which is one strand of the, uh, of the, the agenda, uh, sits really powerfully in the Thrive by Five agenda as well. Um, one of the things that we're seeking, of course, to do in, in terms of advancing the Thrive by Five agenda is to promote the, the, the healthy human development of, of every person, of every child. Um, and at the same time, uh, we know that there's obviously an intimate relationship between those who care for them and, and much of that caring responsibility, the burden of which falls uh, very considerably on the shoulders of women. And so this movement today, um, I think is, um, asks us to, to rethink uh, the way in which society orients itself in relation to women. I think it's a very powerful moment and has serious implications for this campaign. But I did wanna to today just talk a little about um, the Thrive by Five agenda uh, and to explain that Mindaroo Foundation and this particular initiative within it, Thrive by Five, is, as the name suggests, about early childhood development. But the, the campaign that we're seeking to run here uh, is, is really, it's not our campaign, it's really seeking to provide the resources and support for so many voices that have been really talking about this area for such a long period of time. Um, of course, uh, this, this institute, this um, university, uh, has been working so powerfully in the in this area for for many decades, and in in a sense we're relatively new. Although uh, there's been a continuing commitment to this uh, particular area for the last 20 years by by the forest. But what we're seeking to do here is to bring together uh, a, a group of um, people who have an interest in ensuring that every child succeeds. Uh, but also to take those many voices and the many disciplines that Katrina talked about earlier and try to actually come up with one message or at least one message that's able to cut through the political process. And the way we've characterised that is to describe it as a, a demand for universally accessible high quality early learning as a platform for the, the very important uh, levels of support and capacity building that's necessary for, for every child and every family. Um, and the way the campaign is being constructed is as a public facing campaign where we seek to drive uh, content out there in the community to elevate the importance in the minds of the community of these first five years and the way in which a child's brain develops. The second to talk about uh, the question of um, the pressure that's brought to bear on families with the current system and the way that that can be damaging for both the families and, and, the and the child within the context of the family. And finally, talk about this question of female economic empowerment, the way in which the current system discriminates against women. And we find those three public narratives, when they work together, powerfully uh, combine to create uh, very strong support for this agenda. Um, and while we, while we use the phrase early learning, uh, it's, it's meant to be a really a catch-all phrase to describe what many of us uh, would describe as early childhood development. But we've, we've tried to use a phrase which travels beyond preschool, beyond uh, childcare, beyond infant and maternal health, uh, into even the, the world of, of parents in playgroups, and indeed what they do at home. So it's meant to be a catch-all phrase which tries to describe the way in which a child's brain develops in those first five years and how profoundly important that is for their trajectory. So it is a complex thing to bring together all of these various subsystems that exist in this area, try and get them to, uh, to, to 
have a single message, many voices, one message, uh, and to then get salience in the political process so that this issue can actually rise to the top of the political agenda. But I think we're at a we're at a moment uh, today, um, an important milestone in that whole exercise of putting this at the top of the political agenda. Thanks very much, Jay. Uh, at this point, I'll ask Kim Cornish. Kim was uh, another one of our brilliant Monash researchers who was, of course, part of our first town hall. Uh, Kim, I'd like you to just reflect on the comments that you've heard uh, and any issues that stand out to you. Yes, thanks, Ward. It's three, three great presentations. Thank you, Katrina, Marilyn and Michael. Really, really thoughtful. I think what's come through for me for all three is the common theme of, of one size does not fit all. And that, you know, different circumstances surrounding the young child, um, both their genetic environments, their, their environments at home and at school and the communities in which they live, um, determines that and, and pushes forward for, for new personalised um, agendas for childcare that can take into account these differences. So for me, for Katrina, um, her work is with children who have developmental vulnerabilities. And what she was talking about is crafting an environment that is proactive and preventative to do that as early as possible, but to actually do it together. So to, to, to break those silos of services versus education versus parents that are all too common to actually break those down and, and, and come together in, in, in a common goal, which is exactly the goal of Mindaroo. By Marilyn, we, we, we looked at the importance of free universal childcare where all children, no matter where they live in Australia, can actually have services, education, um, work with their parents, work around the community that, that actually brings everyone together for place-based approaches that are tailored to the unique community. And importantly, and just to echo one of the um, one of the um, uh, comments from the audience, and I'd just like to, to say this because it was so eloquently given, is empowering children socially and economically in the future, as well as empowering um, the, the adults around her. And I just think that is a beautiful statement of what needs to, to be achieved. And again, so closely aligned with, with, with Mindaroo. And then with Michael, talked about connections back to policy development and systems change. You know, again, recognizing the different needs of, of, of different children, their communities and their families, um, that often when we talk about um, policy, it can err on the side of universalizing rather than being inclusive, yet also respecting the, the, the way that, 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 that children can differ. So to empower teachers, a conduit for effective policy, and to, to rethink policy so it takes into account the differential needs of the community and that to be at the very centre. So I thought they were, they were fabulous presentations. Thank you. Thanks very much, Kim. And at this point, we're going to throw to the, the Q&A stage of the conversation. And for that, I'll also invite onto the panel our new Dean of Education at Monash University, Professor Viv Ellis. And Viv, I might actually open with you here. Uh, you're the new head of a faculty of education that's responsible for training uh, a lot of our early childhood workforce. What can an education faculty at a university do differently to support the broader objective of Thrive by Five of universal quality, uh, early childhood education for all? Uh, thank you, Rod. I think we've got a lot to do and we can do a lot more as faculties of education. I think probably the first is um, to pick up on something that uh, a colleague has put in the um, chat box is to promote the distinctive um, expertise of early childhood teachers. So there's a public education job around what early childhood teaching expertise looks like, and it doesn't look like, for example, secondary um, teaching expertise. So there's something around promoting that distinctive expertise at the same time as preparing early childhood teachers who see themselves as part of a multi-agency or multi-professional team. So all the speakers so far have talked about the importance of kind of joined up thinking and joined up multi-professional work, health, education, employment support for parents and so on. We know there's very good evidence from the UK and Sure Start 
that was started under Gordon Brown and came out of the Treasury, health, education and economic benefits for society. But I think in the university, we've got a job to do to work with health and other areas more closely. I think secondly, related to that is integrating our cutting edge research more in our programs in our education. And there's a great opportunity for that again around the notion of challenged based research. I think thirdly, we need a more diverse student body leading to a more diverse body of early childhood teachers. And I think that includes indigenous students who become indigenous early childhood teachers, uh, teachers from different cultural, linguistic and ethnic backgrounds that will then go on to become the future teacher educators of early childhood teachers. Um, and fourthly, I think we need new pathways. There's a, a shortage of early childhood teachers. Um, we need to do a lot of work around promoting the benefits of a career in early childhood education. We need to think about pathways in for career changes, as well as uh, opportunities for existing early childhood teachers to develop and enhance their, their current qualifications and skills. So I think there's a lot more that we can do as faculties of education. There are very significant challenges, but very exciting ones as well. Terrific. Uh, Rod, I have a themed question if I can um, dive in here right now. I just want to acknowledge Penny, Helen, Mark, and I apologize if I pronounce your name terribly, Dimitros, sorry, um, have all referenced early on while the speakers were talking around uh, improving training for educators, um, valuing and respecting the skills they have. Now, unfortunately, some of the work we do, we're aware that often the main way we try and change the system here and in other countries is by training the frontline workforce as our sole strategy to improve the system. And we know that is inadequate, inefficient, and in fact, puts an enormous amount of pressure already on those of you who are frontline early childhood educators who not only need to do your job, but then are asked to sort of take on. And so we talk often about what needs to change the sole strategy of, of workforce training alone and that being the only bit of change and not changing the parts of the system behind and around that workforce that they are supported to do the new and enhanced and evidence strategies and consolidate the terrific skills they bring. What other sort of systems and policy changes do we need to do as well as a comprehensive workforce strategy? And Michael, I thought I'd ask you that just to, because I've, I've consolidated a number of speakers and those of you that I called out, there'll be more, but um, I just wanted to, to just acknowledge that and ask what you, if you have some comments about that. Well, talk about a hard question. Um, Put you on the spot. That's my, That was the brief they gave me when they invited me. Go on. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I mean, I think that, um, and it's coming through in the chat there, the, the, there has been um, perhaps, you know, not, not necessarily um, explicitly, but it's turned out this way, a, a massive undervaluing of the, um, of, of what it is that early childhood educators bring to their to their role. And uh, so I think that there is quite a need to, you know, acknowledge that and, and do something about that. And, and I mean, in my view of things, I, I, I have frequently asked myself, why is it that people working in law partnerships get paid the salaries they do, while people who are doing this really important work on the ground in early childhood education services get, get close to minimum wages? Uh, so I think that something there needs to change. But I also think that part of that is, is perhaps recognising, well, it's recognising the professionalism that's there already, but it's also recognising some of the things that come through in this discussion today that is needed, that we need people in, in um, early childhood services who are coordinators of professionals from a range of different disciplinary backgrounds. So it's people who are able to do, do diagnostics on, on children and, and, and then take that from there to actually figuring out what, what's the appropriate help. So I think if those kind of things could be built in, that would lead to a very explicit agenda around Im, Im, improving the um, improving the recognition that that workforce needs, but also uh, perhaps improving the uh, opportunities for people within that and, and, and recognizing the de degree to which uh, perhaps uh, having new leadership positions within there could actually be really helpful for the sector as a whole and for outcomes for children and families. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Robin. Uh, we're now going to go to some questions from uh, the 
crowd. And I might start with Professor Jacinda Elston. Oh, hi. Um, look, and thanks. Uh, look, it's been a fantastic um, conversation already. Uh, it's a question that I wanted to ask really relates to, and I did put something in the chat, um, the significant numbers of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children who, are, who have been removed and who stay in the child protection system across their life um, through till their adulthood. Um, and so I guess, you know, for me, the big question is, what are the policy program and practice implications for something like the Thrive by Five initiative for Indigenous children who are overrepresented in the outer home care system? Those children, if they stay in that system, will continue to go into a disadvantaged life uh, and they will become the parents of tomorrow's children who, who start out with disadvantage in life. And so what sort of drivers um, and pushes can be encouraged through the Thrive by Five program? Who wants to have a go, go at that? I might uh, put you on the spot to start with, Katrina, if that's OK. Um, sorry, I was thinking that might be more of a question for Jay, if Jay would like sure. to beat off. I'll, I'll, have a, I'll, have a, I'll have a crack at that. Having been a child protection minister and looked at the misery that that system is, a bottomless pit of money and with very poor outcomes, despite you know, the workers in that area trying to do the very best they can with it, it we've just got it completely wrong. The idea of having a tertiary removal system where all, all you can do is run a ruler over a family and, and then try and work out what's wrong with them. And then, you know, basically, depending on what the political whim is, uh, take away children because, you know, you're fearful of the consequences of what might happen if, if, um, if they're left within these families. I mean, it's just, it's an absolute abject misery. That's why we've got to completely rethink the early years and intervene so much earlier. So this is fundamentally, the Thrive by Five agenda is making sure that, that every family has the opportunity to be supported, to be the best and strongest family they can be. Uh, and when they have difficulties, these centre-based options provide real opportunities for and are protective of children, but also supportive of parents. So, yeah, I, I think that this is the big answer to the child protection conundrum. It's about the earliest of possible interventions so that we get the best chance of uh, those families staying together. Or if we do have to make that really brutal decision to remove a child, they're removed um, early and that they have stable long-term relationships in whatever settings we're able to arrange for them. Robin. Terrific. We have a question from Jen Jackson that, um, Jen, we're hoping you're happy to ask to Marilyn specifically, please. Um, it was hard to choose between such wonderful speakers. I'm Jen, I work <laughs> at Centre for Policy Development on the Early Childhood Development Initiative. Marilyn, I was wondering, today is a decisive day for a lot of reasons. I was wondering, in your view, what have been the decisive moments of progress in Australia's early childhood system and what have been the messages or the actions that have catalyzed them? That's such a terrific question, Jen. Um, and it's like summing up my 30 years of being in early childhood education and uh, care um, as a researcher and as an early childhood teacher uh, and in long day care. Um, I, when I think about some of the key moments for me, and I won't be able to capture all of them, but the ones that have just come to mind now with you asking this great question is that I think one key thing has been Early Childhood Australia, having a professional association because that's given, um, given a, a vehicle, and I know it's morphed over the years, but it's given a vehicle through which educators, families, different kinds of services can rally together. And there's been some very important leadership that's been taking place in terms of, particularly in terms of um, um, and our Indigenous communities. So, so it's a real 
it's a real um, change agent, in, but it's also a stable, stable group that's been partially funded by government. So I think that's been a really decisive moment from the, I think it was must have been the, the 1960s or little fifth, late 50s that that began and has morphed. So I, I, that was before me. I'll just make that point. <laughs> um, another decisive moment, I think, has been... Um, having the EYLF, the Early Years Learning Framework, the national curriculum, because in many sectors, the national curriculum has brought different services together to have conversations about what does, what does um, curiosity and play look like in the family home? What does it look like if you're occupational health therapist, um, if you're um, physio, if you're a, a um, a playgroup leader, what 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 does, and so it gives a, a kind of a, a space where people can come together and discuss in their particular um, institutions and the services that they provide, um, some vehicle through which a common language can be developed, um, a, a vehicle through which respect for each other's expertise can be gained, and that we don't have to reproduce each other's practices, but we actually actually can work together in a beautiful way. And I think different states and territories have provided leadership in that, in that space um, for making that happen. So that kind of networking. Another, and I just mentioned two more so that I don't take too much time, but another important um, thing that I believe has happened um, as a decisive moment was when the Australian Research Council actually gave early childhood as a category, a category for research. So it made it visible, it made it an area, it meant that it could be funded because this sector, early childhood education and care sector and development has not had this long history of research that many other fields have had in the when we're talking about educators in family homes and in childcare settings, family daycare and so on, playgroups and so on. It just hasn't had that same research base, the same mentoring, as was evidenced by 20 years ago, there only being one professor uh, in this in that area. Um, and so, um, or maybe a little earlier than that, but not, not that much long earlier. Um, and so I think that's been really important as a change moment. And the last one I'll mention is, is that the concept of moving beyond silos and having at the policy level joined up government and then how that translates into practices um, is a different issue. But I think for me, the biggest moment for change as a decisive moment is actually coming back to if we had universal childcare, free universal childcare, it would resource and the sector in all of the things that are coming up in the chat group, because you'd have the stability of staff, you'd have the capacity for renewal and refresh, refreshing in terms of professional development. But also, if you've got this fantastic campaign going on, we can change community perceptions and value the fantastic work that early childhood educators do. We have to have that change at the societal level. And if we don't, I will continue to pay my, the person that comes and helps me with my gardener who can make mistakes on my garden, um, the same salary as I know that an outstanding early childhood educator gets down the road in, in the service that um, she is in. And if she makes a mistake, it's, it's an intergenerational mistake. We just can't keep doing this. So society has to change and that's where we need to go. Thanks for your great question, Jim. And thanks, Marilyn, for your great answer. Uh, I'll throw to another question uh, from Louise Ray here. I hope I've got that pronounced right. Uh, and this is one for Katrina. And I might also ask you to comment on this one as well. Louise. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, I've unmuted. Yep. Yep. Um, yes, look, uh, thank you very much for a fabulous, a fabulous panel of speakers. I'd also like to say that as others have said, I um, manage a community health service in um, Victoria, in Melbourne. Um, but we have the unique position in that I also manage two early childhood uh, services within that um, within the centre. And we have this transition of families between community health and early childhood early intervention. Obviously, I come from a developmental focus, but I just wanted Katrina's comments on the NDIS rollout and um, how it has affected 
the discussions we have with families because as a provider, we have found in the early uh, stages of rollout of the NDIS that we're being pressured to talk with families more about the difficulties and, and the disabilities that children have, even though a disability, a diagnosed disability does not have to be recognised prior to um, age seven. So it's actually been very disempowering for families. And as much as we have wanted to maintain our best practice approach with early childhood, early invention and stay with a uh, strengths-based approach and capacity building, the NDIS has changed a lot of the way that we speak to families now, which has been very disappointing for us. So um, just a comment um, coming from a disability and a developmental delay type service. And I'd love Katrina to comment on that. Uh, thanks very much for the comment and question. I think uh, neurodevelopmental paediatricians generally have been pleased that the NDIS ECEI um, has broadened its outlook um, from the way it was looking when it first started away from diagnoses being required as you've um, you know, highlighted. Um, and so that we feel is a step in the right direction. But just the name of the National Disability Insurance uh, Scheme or system um, with the word disability in it, um, you know, detracts from the very powerful messages of capacity building that you've talked about that the early childhood, early intervention um, groups have worked very hard to build, particularly in Victoria. I think it's, um, it's, it does vary uh, from state to state, and I have worked in New South Wales previously, um, and the way children flowed into these early childhood, early intervention um, opportunities for them has, you know, does vary by place in Australia. So look, it's a, it's a, it's a tough one, um, because if we can't talk about um, opportunities and capacity building, then we are moving away from what I think everyone was talking about in the chat forum and earlier around empowerment, which is really um, a really critical part of this early childhood experience. The children are, the parents of the children are their children's greatest resource and uh, the people in these years that they spend the most time with usually. Um, and we need them to be um, being in, you know, receiving every opportunity and understanding um, that we're keen to provide opportunities for them, for them to um, provide opportunities for their children. So I think it's a conundrum at the moment. Um, I, I think some forward steps with not requiring diagnoses um, and uh, what we've been doing in the clinical work that I do is trying to use um, the International Classification for Functioning Disability and Health to talk most about um, opportunities for acti activities and participation and where supports are needed to encourage those to um, use less of the um, impairment language that you flagged in your, in your chat comment. But thanks, thanks for raising a really important issue. Thanks, Katrina. Viv, on the same question, particularly the, I guess, the strengths versus weakness and the empowerment dimension of this. I don't think I've got much to add to what Katrina has said, other than that, you know, the, the word diagnosis has been used a couple of times now. And I'm always reminded of a, a, a fantastic paper by an American researcher called How a Learning Dis Disability Inhabits a Child. And the way in which a child's future can be shaped by kind of medicalizing or diagnosing certain kinds of disabilities very early on. So the approach that Katrina was just talking about in terms of thinking about the categories as opportunities for different kinds of activity, I thought was really important. Thanks, Viv. Uh, Robin, I might throw to you at this point for some sort of concluding comments and any sort of top line messages that you've taken out of the conversation. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Rod. So um, just again, I'm probably going to start a little bit with what Kim said, but a, a number of things that, that have come through strongly is, um, and some of these are going to be a little bit cliche, I think, and then hopefully I can make it a bit more concrete. So place being important, context is king, if you like, and it is really important to pay attention to that in any large systems of service or workforce change. There was a really nice way that we started about understanding the um, the people that we are here to serve. So children, the caregivers and parents, as was pointed out before, a really important part, particularly in the early years, 
and um, building and focusing service design and policies around them, which is a is a quite a leap that we have to make here in Australia, which all of you would be aware of. And if you think about it like eggs, so if you think there at the center, we then we started having a nice conversation around the workforce and how can workforce training and teacher development be done better, be done in a way that does enable them to use skills in their practice. So somebody's also made a comment, it's quite difficult when, when the workforce get PD applying that in practice, so bridging that research to evidence gap. What, what, what training plus strategies should we be enabling in the system to give the workforce the best shot of being able to trans that practice and research into their organizational settings? There was a little less on the organizational context of where the workforce, where children and families are being served and where the workforce is. There were mention of community hubs. There was mention of other sort of structures, but in, in addition to some work, innovative workforce strategies, that is that training plus approach, we do really need to think about the organizational context that this occurs in, even if we're talking about community playgroups, right through to structured childcare, right through to, there's been a number of chats about thinking about those in the child protection system and how is it that we they can access the same thing as other kids. So I'd like to next, you know, next time I'd be thinking, because that's a really important part of systems change. And then we got to, the policy system level, the policy ecosystem, if you like. Um, sometimes I wonder what people necessarily mean. It's, you know, certain policy levers people have discussed, you know, free universal childcare, policies that have the, the child and the family at the center, but the workforce supported to the best ability we should, right? To enable them to build. So it's, it's like these, it was a really nice kind of almost natural way that we went from the people to the workforce, to the organizational context, to the policy system and how all of these things are um, related and dependent on each other to fit and um, sort of morph and work together because we can't just change something here and just you know hope what we call spray and pray, hope that it will just be changed somewhere else automatically. So thank you, that was what I took away from today. Thanks very much, Robin. And once again, uh, thanks, Robin, for lending your uh, vast expertise to this conversation. Uh, we are coming up to time, so I'd also like to take the opportunity to thank all of our panellists uh, for giving their time. I'd like to thank the Mindaroo Foundation, again, for their leadership and partnership, but also the Mindaroo team, the Essential Media team, and the team of Monash behind the scenes that has made this all possible. Uh, I would encourage everyone to sign up to the Thrive by Five campaign at thrivebyfive.org.au and also to visit the Monash University Better Governance and Policy website where we're developing a, a hub for early childhood resources. Uh, in concluding, can I thank every, each and every one of you for again giving your time. Uh, I apologise we didn't get to more questions, uh, but I thank those who did manage to ask a question and thank all of you for your involvement and your ongoing uh, support in the agenda. Hope you have a great evening and we'll see you next time. Thank you.